All right, so my outline is delayed. That's okay. So first, I'm going to tell you how not to test a profit. And you're like, what? <laughs> how not to test a profit? Well, if you go and evangelize to Mormons, uh, they call themselves Latter-day Saints, they'll basically say, you know, you got to pray about it. You got to, it's, it's, it's your emotions, it's your feeling. You got to have that burning in your bosom. But scripture says that we're not, that our emotions and feelings are not reliable. And the Lord does not give that as a test. If you simply go to Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, uh, verse 9, a familiar text. The Lord says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you compare the heart to all things, it's above all things in reference to its deceitfulness. Right? That's what the text is saying. And who can know the depths of the depravity of man's heart? Your emotions are not reliable. It's not a good test to test a prophet. You also have in Jeremiah 16, which I like this passage better, and sorry, verse 10, verse 10 to 13, it says, And it shall be when you show this people all these words, and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord, they have walked after other gods, and have served them, and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have and not kept my law. And you have done worse than your fathers. So what can be worse than idolatry? It's this. He says... Each one follows the dictates of his own evil hearts, so that no one listens to me. You see that? So instead of what they tell you to do is listen to your heart, don't listen to God. And that's what elders, you know, Elder Jimmy, Elder Johnny, that's what they're going to tell you to do. They're going to tell you to uh, basically appeal to your heart and see what your heart says. What does your emotion say? But God doesn't give that as a test to test whether or not uh, it's a, if a prophet is from God. This is the test. This is one of the tests that God gives us. And so go to Deuteronomy 18. So you have uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The last book in the Torah. In chapter 18, this is the test that God gives us to test whether or not a man is from God or not, or speaking on behalf of God. And go to verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your, brother, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the Lord your God in Orab, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. And will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require of him. So it speaks to us about man's responsibility. But look what it says in verse 20. It says, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, 
or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know that the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. And the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you shall not be afraid of him. So it gives us a test, and that test there is prophecy. So let's do a little compare and contrast, shall we? Let's look at Old Testament prophets, and we'll also look at Christ in reference to prophecy. And then also let's compare that with the prophets of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and see which one holds water. Now, this is good for believers in reference to, it builds your faith when you think of these prophecies. When you think of these prophecies and how God fulfilled them and how they came to pass. For the non-believer, it should be absolutely terrifying. And in reference to evangelism, you can take someone through this. You can take someone first to Deuteronomy 18. Here's one of the tests of a prophet. And then just say, well, let's test your prophet. Let's see how your prophet stands. And let's see if he is worthy to die. And there they were to be stoned to death. So let's do a little compare and contrast. But before we do that, go to Isaiah 41. You have the wisdom literature, and then you have Isaiah. And go to Isaiah 41. Sorry, verse 20. For scripture says that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Verse 21, present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the King of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter ends of them, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing in reference to these idols, and your work is nothing, and he who chooses you is an abomination." In other words, God puts the test out that he declares uh, the beginning from the end, that he's sovereign all over, all over history, that when God declares something, it comes to pass, and that reveals to us that he is God, that he is truly who he says he is, that when he says something, it is fulfilled and it comes to pass. And those other guys... Well, they're not gods. And as it says in Deuteronomy, they're just demons. Right now, Mike is passing an outline. And I'm going to have to go through this quickly because I don't have that much time. But you can, with the outline itself, you can do the research. It's fine, I have it. You can do the research on your own. And again, it's better to know the truth than the lie. And God proves himself that God is true and that every man is a liar. Like these false prophets, all false prophets are, liar, are liars and they just speak presumptuously. You could probably think of several false prophets who are still living today who made predictions and did not come to pass. 
But that just proves that they are not of God. And how many times does a false prophet need to make a false prophecy in order to be a false prophet? One. Just one. And for that one, they deserve death. God is sovereign and he's in control of all things and he declares the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. Let's stick around in Isaiah for a little bit and let's look at the prophet Isaiah. Go to chapter 39 and verse 5. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when that, that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. He's predicting the Babylonian captivity, which does not take place in Isaiah's lifetime, but takes place later, not only does Isaiah predict the captivity of Babylon, or <laughs> Babylonian captivity, he also predicts the person who will restore them after the captivity, by name. Go to Isaiah 44. I'm not going to read the whole passage. Go to verse 28 of 44. It says, Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. So not only does he mention the king's name, who's going to restore them after the Babylonian captivity, he also mentions what he's going to do in reference to the temple, and that is fulfilled in Ezra. And then you also have Nehemiah. Nehemiah builds the walls, and then in Ezra it tells the story of the building of the temple. And that was done by the decree of Cyrus. By the way, Cyrus was not a Jew, but he was a Persian. That speaks to the sovereignty of God. Now, let's compare that with the prophet Nephi. Uh, you might not know him. That's good. Um, <laughs> because he is one of the prophets mentioned in the Book of Mormon. This guy right here. So, if you have your Book of Mormon, turn, <laughs> turn to Nephi, um, one, first Nephi. And I'm just going to read these. If you want a copy of these, uh, just let me know. All right, Nephi chapter 13, and this is verses 26 to 27. After they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the land of the Lamb, from the Jews unto the Gentiles, Thou seeth the formation, I think he had like a old King James at the time and he was borrowing the language from there. Thou seeth the formation of the great abominable church, which is most abominable above all other churches. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. Verse 27 of First Nephi, chapter 13. And all this have they done that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. And he goes on to say in chapter 14, verse 3, And that great pit which hath been digged for, for them by the great... An abominable church, which was founded by the devil and his children, that he might lead away the souls of men down to hell, ye, that great pit which hath been digged 
for the destruction of men shall be filled by those who digged it. Unto their de utter destruction, saith the Lamb of God, not the destruction of the soul, say it be the casting of it into that hell which hath no end. <clears throat> okay. What he was saying there is that the Bible is going to be corrupt, and there's going to be things uh, taken away from the Bible. And not just, you know, little things here and there. He says, from the gospel, plain and most precious. He's talking about things that are vital, that are going to be lost from Scripture. Well, there's several issues with that, several problems. One is the testimony of the New Testament manuscripts. We don't just have one manuscript, but we have thousands of manuscripts of which we can check to see if those things were lost. Now, on top of that, if I remember correctly, Christ said that not even the gate of Hades will prevail against, against this church. So to declare that the gospel was lost for 2,000 years, approximately, that's basically saying that Hades did prevail. And that would, in turn, make Jesus Christ a liar. But we know from the historical evidence and you know, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, that he is not a liar. That his word is yes and amen. Micah makes a prophet, makes a prophecy. We're not going to go there. But he says that Christ is born in Bethlehem. And the Gospels testify that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. In Alma, chapter 7, verse 10, not in your Bible, this is, not, it's still in the, this is in the Book of Mormon, he says that Jesus Christ was born in Jerusalem, not in Bethlehem. So he fails. Now, in the Doctrines and Covenants, which is another writing, of uh, which is you know writing of Joseph Smith and he claims that it's from God and I'm going to read this is Doctrines and Covenants uh, chapter 87 and I'm going to read verses 1 to 4 and verse 8 Ver this King James language is throwing me off uh, verily, thus saith the Lord concerning the wars that will surely come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. <laughs> and the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place, in reference to South Carolina. Notice it's to all nations. For behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states, and the southern states will call on other nations. Even the nation of Great Britain, as it is called, and they shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations and then war shall be poured out upon all nations and it shall come to pass this is verse 4 if you have your book if you have your doctrine of the covenants and it shall come to pass after many days slaves shall rise up against their masters who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war Verse 8, Wherefore stand ye in holy places, and be not moved until the day of the Lord come. For behold, it cometh quickly, saith the Lord. Amen. Uh, several issues with that. Um, some Mormons, will, or those of the LDS, however you want to call them, will say this is in reference to the Civil War. Uh, several issues. 
uh, the Civil War doesn't involve all nations. And if and others would say, well, maybe it's in reference to war, you know, World War War One or World War Two. Well, the issue with that would be, it would have to start in South Carolina. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So issues, and so this would make Joseph Smith a false prophet. Now let's compare that to one of Jesus Christ's prophecies. If you go to Matthew 24. Verses 1 and 2. Which reads, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Uh, surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. In AD 70, Titus came in and ransacked Jerusalem. On top of that, he destroyed the temple incredible, with incredible fires and heat where they were able to push the stones off the temple mount. And so leaving, and they were thrown down off that, and not one stone shall be left there upon another. You can actually go to Jerusalem presently and see the temple in its present state and how the the stones from the temple are now on the ground, are off the mount, have been tossed over. They're heavy stones, but you can imagine if you have a Roman army like Titus did, you're able to do that. And was Titus a, a Jew? No. No. So he had no, no idea about this prophecy. And why would he even want to fulfill it? Um, so that's a, that's a prophecy by Jesus Christ. Now let's compare that again to Joseph Smith. And this is in Doctrines and Covenants, which is part of the Pearl of Great Price for those who are following along. Uh, if you go to chapter 84... And this is verses 1 through 5. And I'll read it. A revelation of Jesus Christ unto his servant, Joseph Smith, Jr., and six elders, as they united their hearts and lifted their voices on high. Ye, the word of the Lord concerning his church, established in the last days for the restoration of his people as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets and for the gathering of the saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. Verse 3, Which city shall be built beginning at the temple lots, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the western boundaries of the state of Missouri? and dedicated by the hands of Joseph Smith, Jr., and others with whom the Lord was well pleased. Verily, this is the word of the Lord, that the city, New Jerusalem, shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, the place that he's talking about is Missouri, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation." So it's talking about in Joseph Smith's lifetime. For verily this generation shall not all pass away until a house, that's what it says, shall be built unto the Lord, and a cloud shall rest upon it, 
which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. So you have, well, maybe three criteria of this prophecy given by Joseph Smith. It's going to begin with Joseph Smith. It's going to be in the state of Missouri, within the western boundaries, uh, which I think the Doctrine of the Covenants used to say uh, Independence, Missouri, but it doesn't say Independence anymore, it just says Missouri. And dedicated, you know, and a temple shall be built there, and it's within his generation. There is no temple in Missouri, specifically Independence, Missouri. The lot is bare. The Mormons were actually kicked out so they were not able to build their temple. So, failed. Now let me show you a prophecy given by our Lord about himself. Go to Matthew chapter 17. I'm not going to read all of them. But I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit for sake of time. Verse 9 of chapter 17. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. In Matthew chapter 16, he references himself as the Son of Man. So this is a prophecy given by Christ about himself, about his death. And his resurrection. Go to verse 12, same chapter. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and that he did not know, did not know him, but did um, to him whatever they wish. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Verse 22. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. Uh, chapter 20, verse, verses 17 through 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Go to chapter 26. Verse 2. You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So he gives a time reference, also in reference to his crucifixion, his death. Uh, in verses 20 to 35, you have the Lord's Supper, of which he says, This man over here is going to betray me. Not only does he give that prediction, but he also, in reference to Peter, right, verse 33, well, you also have verse 31, where they scatter, right, when the shepherd. Uh, dies on the cross. Verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Specific time frame of which it happens, specific person, and it is fulfilled. Yeah, so it's not just, you know, with uh, he's the prophet of prophets. So with that passage, it's telling, hey, if I foretell the, 
if I foretell the future and it comes to pass, you need to believe that I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. Before Abraham was, I am. And so what's the, what's the purpose in all of this? Well, God is true and every man is a liar. And what does this mean for evangelism? What does this mean for, for anything? Well, if God has fulfilled his, the prophecies and they came to pass the way he said that they would come to pass, that means all those other things in reference to heaven, hell, and future judgment are also true as well. That his fulfilled prophecies guarantee future judgment. And I was about five minutes, a little over time, but uh, just recently I was, I was speaking to someone and I was giving proof on how the Bible is reliable in reference to prophecy and how specific prophecy was and how God is not a God like a you know, revealing prophecy like a Nostradamus type prophecy, which is like vague and just out there and spacey. And you can kind of move the letters around and, and twist some things and it's then fulfilled. Um, <laughs> that's not the prophecy that the Bible speaks of. It's very specific. It gives names. It gives places. It gives times. But I was, I was saying in, in, to this person that... Um, If if God's words are true here, then that speaks that his second coming and his future judgment is also true. That God's going to have to judge every every one of us um, by our works and... um, In, in compare us to his, um, his holy standard, and, you know, if that's, you know, what he says is true, I don't, I don't have to argue it, I don't have to, you know, prove it, God gives us the proof, and his word is true, so, you know, if you're to die right now, you will die in your sins and you will have to face God's undiluted wrath on Judgment Day.